All right, let's get ready now for the next uh, session. Um, it's the very first, and I'd like to welcome on stage our panelists, Professor Daniel Fung, Dr. Priyanka Rajendran, Dr. Sharon Sung, and Professor John Wong. And Dr. Elaine Chu is the moderator for this segment. Welcome to session one of Tomasic Shop House Conversation on Youth Mental Health. I'm Dr. Elaine Chu, Head of Adolescent Medicine at KK Women's and Children's Hospital, and I'll be your moderator for today. Minister Tan highlighted the global surge in youth mental health um, during the COVID pandemic, which has already started pre-pandemic. And we all know about the challenges that youths face today, and this helped to set the stage for this session. In this session, we shall have a quick overview about the current state of youth mental health, some of the key contributors to poor mental health in our yeah. youth. We'll also touch on the issue of mental health stigma that Minister Tan shared, as well as some of the challenges in assessing care. We'll also briefly provide an overview of mental health interventions that we have. So with that, I'd like to introduce our four esteemed panelists for this session. First, Associate Professor John Wong, Senior Consultant Psychiatrist at National University of Singapore, National University Hospital, and Director of My Science Center. Associate Professor Daniel Fang, Chief Executive Officer of Institute of Mental Health. Dr. Priyanka Rajendram, Assistant Director, Integrated Health Promotion at MOH Office for Healthcare Transformation. And Dr. Sharon Sung, Assistant Professor and Senior Clinical Psychologist, Signature Program in Health Services and Systems Research, Duke NUS Medical School, Singapore. I would like to invite the audience both present here at Tomasic Shop House and virtually to post your questions via the pigeonhole as shown on the screen. And with that, I'd like to invite Associate Professor John Wong to start off the session um, by introducing about the uh, a huge overview about the current state of youth mental health and the impact of COVID-19. John, please. Thank you very much. Um, I think the mic is on, so I think this is going live. So good morning to, uh, I think our minister is taking this leave, uh, but good morning to the organiser and uh, Dr. Elaine. I'd like to thank the organiser for the kind invitation, Dr. Vignesh and Dr. Elaine, uh, for joining this panel. So this morning, I would like to take a couple of minutes uh, to cover an uh, overview of the key consideration of uh, mental health concern among youth of today. Uh, this is a academic uh, presentation and essentially uh, the work are uh, referred to from my esteemed colleagues as well as the main study that we have conducted from 2020 and to 2022, the Singapore Youth Resilience and Epidemiology Study, the year study. Um, very quickly, I think I'd like to divide my presentation into two portions. Uh, I'm aware of the clock is ticking. Uh, minister says that we can have a more relaxing mo morning, <laughs> but I think it's pretty pressurizing in terms of time, but we will try to manage so that the moderator can do her job well. Uh, the first three areas that I want to cover during the first part is really to really socialize the idea of what Minister has alluded to. Besides mental illness that clinicians are familiar with, uh, what are we looking at today is uh, the group of um, those with mental distress or mental health distress as well as mental health problem. Second is really, uh, while well, this is coming from youth uh, perspective, parents' perspective and educator. Uh, the second area I'd like to touch on is really the very quick highlight on what the top social mental health uh, issues that teens struggle today. And last but not least is really share uh, three perspectives from the early findings of the Singapore Year study. Uh, Daniel is one of the collaborators in the study. And of course, uh, I think the organizer asked me to touch a little bit on the COVID. Uh, what well, I wouldn't have time to touch on COVID effect on mental health of the youth today, but what I want to emphasize is that the year study, the data were collected during 2021, which is right in the middle of the COVID time. So the first to socialize the mental health and well-being, I think we, the whole morning we have three sessions talking about mental well-being. What are we uh, uh, alluding to? It's really the state of well-being where an individual realizes his own ability uh, and can cope with normal stresses of life because that's his part and parcel of our growing up process. And I think more importantly is that we are able to work productively and make a contribution to our community. And we are all familiar that there are three determinants. Uh, there are multifactorials that will 
will uh, contribute towards a mental well-being or mental health distress. And of course, social, psychological and biological. And during this forum, I'd like to really socialise the idea that social mental health are very, very important and, and that actually uh, precedes many of the, the issues at hand. Um, so who are we to be alluding to? Minister talk about the vintage, uh, Jennifer talk about vintage, and uh, Benedict talk about vintage. Uh, I think basically as far as vintage is concerned, we are looking at the generation where the youth uh, who are uh, in the Generation Z, uh, as far as alluded to, uh, the, the, their focus, their features are really looking at quality of life, their role, uh, defined role, their environment, uh, the opportunity to learn and reward. And of course, the vintage of their parents uh, comes from the information revolution, uh, where parents are struggling with, I think many of us here probably in that generation, uh, where we struggle towards building a better standard of living for our family. And of course, our parents, which is the grandparents of Generation Z, is really looking at the, the, the age of the era, the vintage where they were uh, dealing with industrial revolution, where survival uh, is a key issue, bringing bread to the table, and also they had limited opportunity. So this slide is just to remind us that many of us are aware that adolescent phase, the youth phase, uh, are, are, are challenging and turbulent times for three important reasons. There are many changes biologically, where sexual maturation, physical uh, development uh, takes place and actually puberty most of the time will be completed by 14 to 15 years old. Psychologically, I think you can look at the, the stages of psychosocial development. This is a phase where uh, they experience uh, positively, they can be industrials, they can identify themselves, they um, uh, develop intimate relationship. But if the, they have difficulty in this area, then what they experience is really inferiority, uh, role confusion and isolation. What I want to emphasize is that the youth uh, generally is seen as a period of transition from dependence of childhood uh, to adulthood's independence. But many of us are not aware that interdependence as a members of a community is an important attainment of adulthood. Uh, this slide basically just reminds us that while we look at medical perspective of all the so-called mental health illness, uh, a third of them actually starts in the adolescent years. Um, and the onset, first onset usually happens during this window of adolescent years. But what is important is that this is really the tip of the iceberg. So moving towards uh, social health interaction, uh, we did a poll with secondary school teachers. What are the top 10 social health issues teens struggle with today? This, is, this was a poll somewhere early this year and last year, quite recent. Uh, not surprisingly, as in line with the team today, the social media uh, top the most as uh, the session following will address it. Uh, what I really want to socialize this morning is really the depression and anxiety challenges uh, and peer and academic issues. Um, what are the, 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 the reasons why the social issues are, uh, are important uh, uh, focus? It's really technology has changed or amplified the struggles of young people. Uh, the digital communication has changed how one communicate or lack of skills to communicate. And secondly, um, the, besides communication, it's really the interpersonal emotional management. Um, to touch on the, 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 the COVID, we did a, a COVID survey with the population uh, in um, early, uh, mid-2020, uh, just during the, the, the middle of the circuit breaker. You realise that besides uh, experiencing stress from isolation, from circuit breaker, from uh, disruption, uh, many families actually experience similar level of stress uh, by working at home or staying at home. And that is something that uh, spilled over to the children and the school age uh, uh, teens. Um, so essentially, most of the teens, uh, as clinicians here, we have seen uh, students or youth presenting to our clinical services um, with this range of issues, and they could attribute to the effect of COVID in that before COVID, they did not experience similar issue. Most of the time, the media will ask, did we see an increase in that? I don't think anybody could comment on that, but generally, we are seeing patients or, or teens who say that they are able to identify this as an important contribution. So the last part, I think the time is up already, pretty stressful. Um, I just want to go through the slides uh, uh, to highlight three areas. So I'll just fly through the slides, you just pardon me. I'll stop at one or two important slides. So this is a study that um, uh, was conducted 2020 to 2022. We just finished our data collection in March this year. So this is really just to distill three areas 
for this morning's conversation. Uh, we had 3,336 3, uh, respondents in phase one, where we look at at risk individual uh, in detail, as well as 10% of the normal so called uh, low risk uh, individual. And we screened for uh, a, a series of uh, mental health issues of concern. Three areas to highlight one is the age effect. You notice that um, uh, the you self-report total score is a representation of loading of mental health symptoms. And we notice that at 11 years old, P5, that cohort has the lowest. They are just starting life. Uh, but significantly and statistically significant is that by 15 and 16 years old, they pick. Uh, and this is the age that we need to pay attention to. And the next slide uh, tells us that for anxious and depressed symptoms, 14 and 15 and 16, again, is statistically significant. And we need to look at this age group closer. And of course, uh, the services could target uh, uh, reaching out to them better. And between internalizing and externalizing symptoms, you can see the red column below. Um, about a third, one in three of the uh, surveyed individual of the 3,336 actually uh, experience internalizing symptoms, mainly anxiety, depression. But one in, there's one in three, one in six actually exhibited externalizing symptoms. So obviously there is a difference in presentation and how they are distressed. Um, and of course, uh, sorry, back to the slide. You look at the borderline column. This is the part where the minister was alluding to people are having mental health distress or problem. They do not meet the criteria of mental health disorder or illness. And we add another 1 in 6, 15%, and add another 10% to the load. And that helps explain why the healthcare services, the social services are overwhelmed. Because they are seeking service. So this is a, a, a quick snapshot of mental distress. Mental health problem is one big group I think our social services, social health services should target at because they are underserved, they are underreached. Mental illness, obviously, uh, is something that the healthcare services will continue to contribute in serving this population. And this basically tells us that among the eight groups of symptoms, anxiety, depression, and anxiety, uh, de withdrawn depression are the topmost. 20% of them meet clinical uh, severity which is quite important, one in five. Um, and uh, the, the attentional problem, these are associated comorbidity because they are students, uh, about one in 10 of them actually uh, would have impact in their learning process as well. So coming back to a very quickly round off, I think we exceeded the time already. Uh, this is the, the resilience part, the second point from the study I want to share. Uh, the Singapore Euro Resilience Skills is a skill that NUS developed and we use this to measure the resilience of the individual. There are 10 factors. But what is interesting is that we thought with age, the individual's resilience of the age group should rise with time. But to our surprise, and of course we were very sad, we saw a U-shaped curve. So we were wondering how come well, after building up resilience, the older age uh, adolescent actually become less resilient. As we look a bit deeper, we realise that resilience is a calibration of an individual's ability to cope with stress, normal and uh, adverse stress, but it's also the, 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 the uh, ability as versus the external uh, factor. So during this period of time, obviously something is happening in the 14 to 16 years age group, and that's among that. And when we look at the, the most distressed individual where they have uh, attempts to kill themselves or having suicidal ideation, we look at those who did not have the idea uh, or the attempt, we find that there's a statistical significance between those who are more resilient versus uh, less resilient and statistically highly significant. Then what is it that in the 10 factors that has the most greatest impact that the social group uh, services should target that? You look at the big large effect factor and Cohen D, the uh, extreme right column, uh, 1.13 and 0 0.8 are the large effect size. So positive self-image and building relationship are the most protective factors uh, that will help an individual fight against attempts to self-harm or even uh, 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 suicidal ideation. The rest are all significant, they are all moderate effect size. Uh, so actually I was teasing my psychologist colleague, uh, that actually put social worker higher up on the list than psychologists doing intervention than individual. Sorry, psychologists. <laughs> okay, last but not least, the last slide is really talking about uh, what are the perceived stress. This is an academic expectation. My MOE colleague reminds me that I must mention the word expectation. It's not the academic stress, but what is the expected stress, uh, stress coming from the expectation of their performance. You find that 
the expected stress on individual is much greater, uh, large effect size compared to expectations from parent and teacher. But both are high, to be very honest. Um, and I think this is something that we should look into uh, to how to better manage expectation. In the later session, I understand MOS uh, Sun Shelin will, will have a, a, a panel. Uh, she has been talking about how to redefine success. I think this is something that we should look at. Okay, I think that's all I have. Uh, uh, last slide, okay, sorry. Uh, we did a poll with uh, teachers. Uh, and the teachers describe their students uh, with the word cloud on the left. You see words like achievement-oriented kind of description. We don't see any description of how they experience a process, how they actually ex uh, experience a relationship. Whereas on the right is a model where you talk about success model that looks at success from not just results, but the process and the relationship. So I think this is something that we should look at. And uh, social-emotional learning is one important uh, uh, area that I think the social sector should really look at to address this. I think that all, that's all I have uh, to say that all the teens today really need to be helped and be guided or mentored and encouraged to develop a sense of purpose. All right, I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Associate Professor John Wong. Next, I would like to invite Associate Professor Daniel Fang to share on the key contributors to poor mental health in youth. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Thanks, John, for taking all, all my time. <laughs> I'm finished. <laughs> well, I guess um, you know I'm I'm He's I'm part I, of the so I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, I I'm you know I'm just thinking uh, uh, what what would I add to uh, to what John has already said? He's covered most of the stuff. Uh, I think uh, you know I, I don't feel very comfortable today. Actually, it's hard to relax when you're wearing a suit and you know in the shining lights and. I'm much happier, actually, very often, <laughs> when I'm at home in, in my shorts while I've got my suit on and, uh, and, and talking to people in my own uh, natural self. And I think that's important to recognize that mental health is a very personal thing, right? And um, the dimensions of mental health, I think John has spent some time talking about it. I won't go very far into it. This is the original definition by WHO in, back in 1940s about health. And then disease and disorder is really a pathological process. Mental illnesses are, in fact, brain disorders. And illness is actually an experience of the disease. Uh, it's not the same thing. A lot of us get confused. If you have a disease, you have very different manifestations. Just, not, just now, we were just talking about you know, COVID-19. Some of us get sore throat. Some of us get pneumonia. Some of us die. These are the experiences of illness. And uh, it's, it's slightly different. What is sickness? A Canadian um, GP back in the 70s said, Sickness is how society or the population views the disease. And that view um, is dependent on the social norms of the day. Right? So it's important to understand these concepts. Uh, there is disorder and disease, there is sickness, and there's health. And they actually form... Uh, oh, <laughs> there goes my... Um, I like my morph images, but I <laughs> suppose they don't, they've lost it in the older version of, uh, of, uh, of <laughs> Microsoft PowerPoint. Anyway, imagine a triangular pyramid you have sickness, hidden side of a uh, illness on the other hand, and health, which affects all of us. Now, the, um, it is important, I, I think, to think about uh, stigma. So I think, uh, Priyanka, you're going to talk about stigma, so I won't go very much into it. This is an old study that we did, um, um, and hopefully we have new data now that will uh, reinforce some of this. Um, uh, NCSS has just completed a very... Uh, uh, a comprehensive study. I hope that they will publish the results and share. But what, what's important about stigma is that it affects people coming to help. It affects... Um, the, and for our young people, self-stigma is probably more significant than social stigma. They are much more willing to help others. Um, and, but when it comes to themselves, they tend not to seek help. So that's one potential risk uh, in getting young people forward to seek help, especially if you give a lot of awareness about mental uh, health and mental illness. What about the context of mental illness? You know, do, has, has children's mental illness changed? We did a number of studies. Uh, this is just uh, looking at the uh, hospital data in our particular cluster, NHG. What we've seen is that, you know, uh, the diagnosis of depression, and this is across uh, the entire cluster, uh, including uh, primary care as well as in uh, IMH. And what we've seen is that there's an increase in diagnosis of depression, much higher than uh, increases in the rest of the population. All right? And that's, that's worry. Uh, the other piece that is important about depression uh, is that 
Asian depression is very li much linked to the relationships of our young people in uh, whether their homes, how their parents feel about themselves, as well as uh, in school, how their teachers think of them, um, and of course, finally, how their peers relate with them. So relationships are quite important, and the interpersonal dimension uh, of depression is, is an important factor. Now, this is an old study. I, I suspect that this has not changed uh, that much, and um, uh, uh, the, we, we created a scale that looked at this interpersonal dimension. Uh, what I've tried to say over the years is that we need more interpersonal therapies, which we have not really developed over time, and that's something that to, for us to think about. Oops, I'm past my time as well. My last uh, um, contributor uh, to sort of uh, bad uh, or poor mental health is really this, this idea that um, adverse childhood experiences, and this is from our Singapore Mental Health Study in 2016 of adults, right, uh, 18 and above, what were the factors uh, that, uh, that, that gave them mental illnesses and, and even physical illnesses in adulthood were these adverse childhood experiences. So mental illnesses are determined by the mental health of young children, infants, children, and adolescents. So it is important for us to remember that that's important. So uh, before we go away with this idea that, um, you know, uh, Contributors of Poor Mental Health, that was my, my topic that uh, Vic had given me. But I, uh, I wanted us also to think a little bit about there are uh, protective factors. This is a concept by Antonovsky. I don't have time to go into it. Maybe later we'll talk about it. But what's key here is that um, there are umbrella terms that covers good mental health, contributors to good mental health. And we've actually done studies over the years uh, looking at things, things like gratitude, a sense of coherence, um, uh, resilience. These are important things to think about uh, so that we don't think of contributors to poor mental health as, as purely uh, negative and risk factors. So I think that's my, well, I've passed my time anyway. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll talk some more in the conversations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, next, I would like to invite Dr. Priyanka to share on mental health stigma as well as the challenges to assessing care. Thank you, Elaine. Um, very, very good morning, everybody, esteemed guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for this opportunity to speak with you all about a topic that is very close to my heart on stigma. Um, it's close to my heart because I think, um, you know, I've worked with uh, many youths in my professional and personal capacity and the level of self-stigma and self-blame can be quite heartbreaking. Uh, secondly, also, I think I'm just sort of, uh, I myself am currently in my final year of youth by the traditional definition and uh, naturally getting a bit more reflective in my elder millennialhood or in today's context, I guess, my vintage millennialhood. Um, so, oh, <laughs> that was fast, yeah. Okay, so I guess before we dig deeper uh, into, into stigma on its own, uh, uh, you know, uh, Prof. Um, uh, John did touch on this, about what is natural actually for adolescents and youth. So it's completely normal for them to be emotional, right, and to experience various types of emotional distress and take more risks. Um, and this is the time when they're really seeking their identity, they're seeking identity, their purpose, the sense of belonging, and all in a, in a space where they are highly emotional and you know the rational thinking part of their brain is not quite developed yet so and they, at this point they're uniquely sensitive right to the judgment of their peers their teachers their parents uh, and these these groups of people form their immediate sort of concentric circle of uh, influence so with that in mind um, let's first squash a few tempting fallacies now why are our youth struggling so much, right? And, uh, you know, I adapted some of this from a, a great article I read in The Atlantic. Um, now, the first fallacy is that, oh, yeah, we can all chalk this up to normal behavior of adolescents and youth, right? And um, now, while certain unhealthy behaviors have increased, uh, for example, binge drinking and things like that, there are also certain positive behaviors that have also increased in the youth. For example, social consciousness, um, you know, the openness to talk about feelings and things like that. So that's not something that we should discount. 
The second fallacy really is that uh, adolescents and youth have always been moody and sadness only looks like it's rising because people are not willing to talk about it. Um, now, as we can see from the various studies that were shared in the earlier talks, objective measures of anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicide are all increasing, um, and especially over the past decade. So it's no illusion really that it's a real problem. The third fallacy is that today's mental health crisis amongst youth is really principally caused by the pandemic and an overreaction to COVID-19. Now, uh, rising youth mental health challenges during COVID is not a new trend, but an acceleration of a trend that already existed. And in fact, what we can actually see from this crisis is that it offers some clues about what is really driving this rise in uh, mental health illness, especially with regards to depression and anxiety. So, I, I, you know, um, the previous speakers have touched on some of these propelling forces. I think social media came up very strongly. And, uh, you know, we, we should think about social media not as, uh, not as rat poison, which affects everybody equally, but rather almost akin to, to alcohol, right? Where it is, it is mildly addictive and can enhance your social situations, but also lead to dependency and depression in a, an, in a few so, uh, and this is actually uh, corroborated by an Instagram internal report where one third of girls who were tested actually said that going on Instagram made them feel more sad, but they just couldn't help themselves from logging on. So it has this sort of, uh, it seems to hijack like this peer sensitivities and really drive obsessions with body image and popularity, uh, making it just harder for young people to cope really. Um, and because of that, of course, oops, Sorry, did you know, I just skip that slide? But okay. Anyway, because of that, uh, you know, with more time on your digital uh, platforms, there's less time at socialization. Uh, and I just wanted to touch a little bit on modern parenting. Um, so, you know, modern parenting doesn't imply that traditional parenting is is the way to go. Uh, but what there's a specific part of modern parenting where global research has actually shown that, um, you know, that more, there, there is a broader use now of, of accommodative parenting. And what that means is, for example, uh, you know, my kid doesn't like, to, doesn't like dogs. That would mean that I just avoid all houses with dogs. My kid doesn't like vegetables. Okay, you don't have to eat vegetables. Here, here you go. And, and you know, we do it out of love. Um, but what this actually takes away is a part of growing up that is learning how to release your negative emotions uh, in uncomfortable situations. And if they never figure this out as kids, they're probably more likely to struggle mentally later in life. Um, so now, during this sort of series of uh, focus groups that we did at, uh, at MOHT, stigma, of course, came up very strongly as one of the reasons for uh, why help-seeking behaviours are, uh, are challenged in that sense. Um, and it was, it was more akin to the fact that there was a lot of misconception about the disease and therefore unwillingness to really interact with people who have mental illness. Now, um, this is really, it's, it's nothing new. Uh, it's something we know. Oh, now I just want to move. Uh, doesn't seem to be moving. Ah, there we go. So, um, yeah, this is nothing new. We recognize it. Uh, it has been there all along, and, um, and we've been working on it, but there is still so much to do. Um, you know, in a 2017 study uh, done on mental health stigma here, they found that almost half of the youth uh, uh, studied um, actually associated mental illness with negative terms. And uh, almost half also said that they would be very embarrassed if they were diagnosed with mental illness. Now, a lot of this is due to um, the various faces of stigma, which can be your public stigma, your systemic stigma, your self-stigma. Your public stigma largely due to your traditional beliefs and mindsets, especially in Asian societies, um, where um, you know, there's, uh, it's, mental illness is often associated with a lot of shame, uh, a lot of loss of face, and so nobody wants to talk about it, nobody wants to acknowledge it, and then nobody seeks help. Um, systemic uh, uh, stigma in the sense that we have one of the lowest rates of psychiatrists per 100,000 uh, residents. And uh, self-stigma in, in, in how there is a significant treatment delay. Uh, among people suffering with mental illness here. So now, perhaps instead of seeking to destigmatize an issue, which implies an action of really undoing something that might be wrong, uh, which is always harder, maybe we should think about how we can seek to normalize 
uh, conversations around mental health, which implies uh, an action of creation that is more hopeful and more positive. So, um, you know, I'm glad to see more prominent mental health campaigns coming out in recent years that are trying to do just that, which is to normalize. Um, and also the fact that, you know, we now have an interagency task force, right, bringing together all the agencies together to look at the mental health and well-being of our country, uh, including the youth, which would really help go a long way in terms of the systemic stigma that, uh, that exists. And to send an imp it sends an important message to Singaporeans that this is a shared care and a shared responsibility, and we all, we all have vested interest in this. Um, now, the language we use, of course, is so important uh, when it comes to stopping self-stigma with compassion. And just when someone says that they're struggling, I think we all have to remember just how much courage it took to actually say that out loud. Um, so, I mean, it's not all bad news. Uh, as, as Prof. Daniel said, you know, we can always tap on what are the protective factors as well. Uh, let's not forget, you know, to focus on the strengths of, of the youth. You know, they're seeking their identity, their purpose, their belonging. Let's tap on that and let's um, figure out how we can use their strengths to to change that self-stigma and the self-blame that, that, that happens. Um, and of course, education, parents, friends, they all play a huge role in this strength-finding journey. And um, it will go a long way towards normalization of mental health uh, as we move forward. So yeah, I think that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Sharon Sung to share about mental health interventions and current challenges in provision of care. Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful today to be here among this group and to be talking uh, to those of you who are online, uh, to be able to really come together and talk about these issues and look forward into how we can improve things for the community here in Singapore and maybe lessons that we can teach to the global community. Uh, so I've been asked to talk a bit about gaps in care, challenges globally that we face in uh, taking care of all the young people who need it, um, and a little bit about what treatment approaches we have. So as you've already heard, there's a tremendous number of young people who experience mental health problems. Globally, it's up to one in seven. Oops, this is very sensitive. Okay. There we go. <laughs> uh, so one in seven, and that is born out here in Singapore as well, with a 25% increase in depression and anxiety over the last couple of years. And this 25% increase is actually even higher among our young people. So the onset of mental health difficulties is typically in the child and adolescent years. There's tremendous disability that this exerts across the lifespan. And if you see this uh, sort of pear-shaped picture, that shows life, uh, years of life loss due to disability exerted by different mental health conditions over the years. So you can see this uh, starting in childhood and really lasting through young adult and uh, people's early middle age, their prime working years, their prime educational years. So it is a vast problem worldwide. So there has always been a very big need. It's true that we're seeing higher rates. There has also traditionally been a, a lack of trained providers to care for this group of people. Uh, mental health tends to be organized as a specialty service. So provided by professionals in hospitals uh, and requiring quite a lot of specialist training. That means it's resource intensive to have professionals. And also we see that there's quite a small number of resources devoted to mental health care. So WHO says that actually less than 2% of most government budgets are devoted to mental health care. And it's even less than that, 0.5 in uh, low and middle income countries. So this means that people, even when they do identify that they're having mental health issues, have a tremendous difficulty in getting the kind of care that could help them. We've already heard a lot about stigma, self-stigma, and uh, broadly stigma within a population of what it means to be experiencing mental health problems. But if you think about the rates that we're talking about, every one of us will either experience or have a family member or a friend who experiences these things in our lifetimes. And I think one of the benefits actually of the pandemic is that it's allowed us to start talking about these things and recognizing that mental health is health and that we will all uh, need to take care of ourselves and take care of each other. But there remains a very, very large treatment gap. And what the treatment gap means is the difference between the number of people who could benefit from mental health care and those who actually receive it. So WHO would tell us that three out of every four people who need mental health treatment don't get it. 
Uh, and we know from the Singapore mental health study conducted actually prior to the pandemic that nearly 80% of people in Singapore who would benefit from mental health treatment over the previous 12 months from the time they were surveyed also didn't get it. There's also a significant delay even for those who do seek and receive care between the time that they're experiencing symptoms and impairment and when they actually get to see somebody and get some help. This can range from one to two years locally for uh, young people with depression or anxiety up to 11 years, and that's for young people with obsessive compulsive disorder. If you think about 11 years of a young person's life, typically OCD starts in, uh, you know, around 10 or 11 years old to really cause problems. If they've gone 11 years, they're now 21 years old, and that's just for the first touch with uh, a specialist. We also see people an average of one time in mental health care. So we have a huge problem in really meeting those needs. It's important for communities to really come together and address these. Um, the, I guess the silver lining, but also the tragedy here, is that we have very effective treatments that help people um, really get back on track and build wonderful lives. Uh, psychotherapy approaches are very effective. We have good medicines that work for people who need them as long as they get uh, tailored care. Then uh, even in schools teaching about social emotional well-being, social skills and connectedness and resilience is also very helpful for young people with um, attentional difficulties, teaching them uh, study skills, executive functioning, how to plan and organize their time. All of these things are really very effective, as well as interventions that are more broad about overall well-being. If we sleep well, if we're eating well, uh, exercise, all of these things really promote mental health and well-being in a holistic way. But when we don't talk about it, and when there's been an emphasis on only specialist care, it means we're not taking very good care of our young people, broadly. Um, I'm going to speed through a little bit. That You saw that pyramid that I think uh, it was also shown by Prof Wong, that traditionally services have been uh, recommended to be delivered in a sort of pyramid shape where we do preventive uh, education at the broad-based population level where we see people who are having more severe and more impairing conditions in general hospitals or primary care and where we should reserve specialist care uh, like at IMH for people who are really much more severe and need a longer-term care. It's not always been organized that way, but that's a traditional model. I just finally wanted to share some really, from young people's perspective, what gets in the way for them in seeking help. So this is a meta-analysis of 52 studies, so a combination of pooled data from a number of studies across the world where young people are letting us know what gets in the way for them in seeking mental health care. So you've heard already about some of the individual factors that not having knowledge or recognition that what they're going through actually is a mental health condition that could benefit from uh, professional care. They also really don't know when, why, or how to seek care. Our, our systems, even in Singapore where there's been a tremendous push to bring mental health care into the community, it's still fragmented and it's still difficult for people to know how to get what they need. Uh, even though we've got things like chat you know, down uh, on Orchard Road where, where the kids are, they still don't really know that that's there. Um, sorry, let me go back. Yeah. Um, there's also ongoing stigma. People feel embarrassed. They don't want to put their hand up. As was mentioned, they're much happier to say, oh, my friend's suffering or struggling, but not me. Don't look at me, <laughs> right? And they're also, I think this hasn't been discussed, are concerns about what it means to talk to a professional, whether they can actually trust those of us uh, sitting here, right? Whether they, uh, what they share with us will remain confidential, if it's a safe place, and if we'll understand them. Um, so these are really important things to consider when we're trying to bridge those gaps. And finally, there's a lot of structural issues. Mental health care does remain costly. Um, it's hard to access. Even, the, even as we increase the number of providers on the ground, wait times are very long. If, uh, for me, when I see somebody, if they miss one appointment with me, they have to wait four to six weeks till they could even get back in to see me. And it's really, really hard to provide good care in that context. Um, so services remain hard to navigate. And I know some of the conversations today, we're trying to figure out how to improve that for our young people. 
But as I mentioned, this has been, it's a time of uh, crisis in the world, but also a time for opportunities to shine the spotlight on mental health and mental health being part of general health and well-being, the importance that it has for us, uh, for all of us in our lives. And we're seeing some, some great changes in terms of opening up the conversations, increasing access to care, even having mental health care included in insurance, which it wasn't included in most insurance plans locally, and trying to access, uh, allow people to access us th with technology um, to get through those things that really cause logistical bottlenecks and barriers. So I just wanted to end with some of the good news from uh, the past year plus that I've seen here. All of the ways we're leveraging technology, trying to get care out to people who need it. So thank you very much. It's really great to be here to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, next, I shall go move on to the Q&A session. Um, so it's actually on the minds of everyone as well as the questions posed on pigeonhole in terms of what do you all see as the vision for the future with access, respect to access to mental health care and some of the challenges and maybe opportunities that you see in terms of achieving this. Uh, maybe I'd like to start with uh, Associate Professor John Wong, please. Sorry, <clears throat> do you mind just repeat the question as I do the QR scan? It's okay. <laughs> uh, what do you envision for the future with access to mental health care? Oh, yes. And some of the challenges and possibly some opportunities that we can leverage on to achieve this. I, I think first and foremost, I'd like to allude to the uh, approach towards categorization of uh, mental health issues. Uh, traditionally, from a healthcare service perspective, you always look at illness disease model. But I think you have heard many a times that actually there is this uh, grey zone where individual may be distressed from time to time uh, and may experience problems from time to time. So I think the, from the service perspective, I think we should look out and reach out to this group of individuals, uh, whether through the community services uh, uh, programs or through a institutional or organization program. I think that's something that uh, the forum, it would be good for forum or the community to discuss and, and explore that. Um, I think as far as improving access, I think I have two things to share. Uh, one is that I think uh, you heard uh, from uh, Priyanka, Dr. Priyanka talk about uh, stigmatization and, and uh, mental health literacy. Uh, I think as a clinician, many of us came across where for youth, uh, we are seeing increasing number or more youth, uh, especially secondary school student age group, going to polyclinic asking for professional assessment and professional services. But a lot of time, is challenging that their parents who may not have the equivalent uh, level of mental health literacy actually are very resistant or very hesitant. So I think when you talk about mental health literacy, uh, it's not just reaching out to the student, to the youth. I think we should look at the population at large, especially the parents. Uh, because as we see, uh, the youth is an age of transition. They are still very much in a phase of dependency on the family support and the family uh, guidance. And the other thing I did not uh, uh, alluded to uh, uh, or highlighted is that during the adolescent phase, while biologically and uh, psychologically they develop uh, 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 in phases, but in far, as far as social uh, perspective, you notice that um, in our legal system, uh, 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 youth only come to age uh, adulthood at 21, and they only uh, are given the right to consent to marriage. Uh, at 21. So the law, the, the legal system and the society perspective is still very much treating an individual under 21 as a minor. And as a result, their social responsibility doesn't commensurate to what the kind of legal empowerment that they should have. I'm not trying to advocate for the next election to be 18 years old, but I'm saying that I think it's important to see the disconnect between social expectation versus what the society, the community is prepared to empower them. So I think that's something that we should think about. Thank you, thank you. I was just going to yeah. mention that actually you can get married uh, at 18, but with, but, but with parental, oh yeah, yes. yeah, with parental yeah. consent. With parents consent. So, so. <laughs> yeah. But not, not uh, independently, yeah. yeah. Um, next, um, I would like to pull out a question from Pigeon Hole. If you had a magic wand and would could just introduce one practical intervention or policy change, what would have the greatest impact in improving the situation? Maybe I'd like to invite Daniel to comment on this. <laughs> I wish I had a magic one. Uh, I, I, okay, there's one thing I can do. I, I would, you know, I, I, I try to cease labeling so much. 
Uh, I know in the healthcare, the, it's part of our training as, as doctors, we, we like to make diagnoses. Um, but until we understand the neural networks better, and, and I think it's, we're still some way away, uh, and when we cannot find lesions, uh, we, we tend to over-medicalize things, uh, thinking that the medical solution is the solution for mental health. And I think it's not. So if, if, if we could take away the labels and just identify distress, um, you know, and what you can do with distress, create a flexible system. Uh, I know Sharon talked about the pyramid, um, and that is traditional. Can we have a flatter system where people can access uh, uh, help uh, as they need it uh, in the places where they exist? Uh, for young people, it's the schools and the community. Are these available? Um, do we have a variety rather than a very rigid way of referral systems? So, um, yeah, that would be ideal. And then, of course, with an educated public, uh, people know how to calibrate their needs. Uh, you know, with a well-educated population, uh, as in Singapore, you have this opportunity really to get uh, people to seek help on their own. Uh, I'm advocating that, uh, you know, um, everyone should have some skills that they uh, train themselves. It'd be wonderful if everyone is their own physician, um, in, a, in a sense, right? And so you need to train that. Uh, we unfortunately don't have those classes in school. Uh, we have this thing called health education, which is kind of, uh, you know, teach to everyone to be your own doctor, right? Uh, let's let's hit, take it on, you know, and say, okay, make your own diagnosis, and then seek the help that you need. Create that flat system. Um, and, and, and then, of course, when it comes to medications and other kinds of therapies, uh, you can have a kind of resource for people to go to. So my magic one is keep things simple, make it a bit more widely available, you know, flatten the pyramid into a rectangle. What do you call that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Sharon, do you have um, any other comments? Or, you know, do you know of any innovative model of care that kind of like flattens the pyramid, improve access to care? Well, you know, we were chatting earlier about a push towards community care and trying to really educate all of the many people that young people come in contact with to be able to recognize and understand mental health concerns. But one of the challenges with that is that, uh, say, for example, teachers and uh, doctors in the emergency room didn't go into their field because they want to be psychologists or psychiatrists. So sometimes I think we are trying to really broaden that base of care, but in a way if people feel forced into it, it, it doesn't unfold organically. So I think it's maybe in a way trying to talk about it more like what Daniel was saying about interpersonal connection and humanity not necessarily about mental illness, but when we are talking to our students, when we are talking to our patients, that we see them as, as whole people. And if we really encourage that kind of approach in the world, that, that we'll have a better job of getting to know what's going on with someone and being able to provide right sighting for what they need. So a lot of my work, I, I work uh, with some A&E doctors for people who go to the emergency room, but it's actually a stress-related condition, and it presents with headache and chest pains and all kinds of things that goes on for years and years and years because they go and get tested and there's nothing wrong with them physically. Um, so we need to really think about the whole person in all of our contexts. Um, I also think we have so many resources and a lot of what Priyanka's work is doing is really trying to help people navigate all of those possibilities. So I think having, like what Daniel said, lots of different layers and um, kinds of care that fits where the person is. For some people it's broad-based prevention. For some people it's very targeted face-to-face -face interaction with a professional that they need. So we really have to, I guess, personalized medicine has been a big term, right? Precision medicine. But it's more like personalized care broadly, uh, humanity recognizing the person that we're with in the room, yeah. And um, Priyanka, um, how can we actually kind of like help to channel people into the right services? Because I guess now what we are seeing is that there's a huge surge in mental health difficulties, like what uh, John mentioned in the, in the slides. And I think we are all seeing a huge surge in the healthcare system. How can we channel people into the right channels then? Yeah, you know, um, together with this huge surge in mental health difficulties, there's also a huge surge now on mental health help, <laughs> you know, so many apps, so many mental health, uh, yeah, it, it all just, it, it came up, especially during COVID. And um, I think 
on a systemic level, there really is a need for greater coordination uh, of all these services together. And uh, I guess, you know, to a certain extent, the interagency task force is trying to do that. Um, but, you know, there, there are so many digital offerings out there that people are using. Uh, you know, they might, they, and again, we're probably working towards this in terms of like the governance frameworks around these offerings, as well as, um, I think, greater integration and a more systematic sort of um, approach towards the interface between digital tools as well as human-based services. I think it's something that we would need to to study further and really come up with a proper framework for contextualized to our local population. So yeah, I think that would help um, us moving forward, yeah. Yeah, indeed, because I think the integration of um, you know, face-to-face -face human services um, with the digital interventions or uh, application is something that has been still very new to um, the entire healthcare provider community. So I think it's certainly something that it's an opportunity for us to leverage on. And uh, the timer has just told us that we have, you know, reaching the end of the panel discussion. There's been a very exciting and insightful discussion. And indeed, the needs of youth mental health is evolving, it's complex. And we are very glad to have this conversation where we bring in all the various stakeholders. And it's important for us to continue with uh, more dialogues, more engagement. And I'd like to thank my panelists once again for your very rich sharing. Please continue to join us in session two of the discussion where we will... Sorry. Do we have... Oh, we can have... Sure. Okay. So I've been reminded that I've given four more minutes. Um, maybe I'd like to call up the pigeonhole on another very popular question is, to what extent is community-led mental health initiatives helpful in assisting youth mental health needs? This is from a layman, peer-to-peer -peer, um, help and not professional help. And I think it's probably, you know, I think there's some overlap with what Sharon was um, saying about like, you know, how do we kind of normalize, you know, the, the experience of getting help, right? What are your thoughts about this? So for this one, actually, I guess I can share a little bit of what's happened in my workplace, which is, I think, as one of the, I think I'm one of two psychologists in a, a health services research department, right? So uh, while they're focused on social issues and, and healthcare, it's not a psychology department. But what's happened there and throughout the medical school where I work in the last couple of years is they've started to ask for people to be trained as peer supporters, uh, to really learn what resources are available within the organization so that they can lend a listening ear. They can be just, they have their, have their uh, ears out to see, hey, you, somebody could talk to me. They may feel uh, nervous to talk to their boss. They may feel like they don't know how to cope with the stress they're experiencing at work. But, so we now have a dedicated pool of volunteer peer helpers and peer supporters but they're also impaired so they know that they don't need to take care of the whole problem, but they're there as a gateway, as a listening ear who can share information and help people navigate the system and what's there for them. So I do think there's a very big impact on having that and having people know that there's someone they can talk to and it doesn't have to be that level of going to get professional help. Many people don't need professional help, but they do need some resources and some of the nice tools that are in my line actually that help us, uh, principles of cognitive behavioral therapy or stress and coping skills. For many of us, really accessing that can be enough, but we don't know how to get to it or what would be useful. So I think peer supports really can provide a nice bridge and opening to that kind of access. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to add to, to Sharon's point. I think, I think to get that um, peer support um, up, you need literacy. I think, unfortunately, and it's, it's very true today, uh, too much awareness is not good for you. Awareness itself just creates the mystique you know, of uh, mental health. What you want is literacy. It's actually intentional training. Uh, and then with literacy, participation. Look out for people who need help, listen to them, and link them to resources. But all that requires us as a community to say, okay, everyone has to go for, it's like, you know, basic cardiac life support. How many people actually do BCLS uh, today? Um, and, and, and yet people do, and they do collapse. You have to do that. How do we get that out? How can, how can we have that mental health literacy out in the community? 
uh, not just awareness. Awareness is great. This is an awareness building, uh, you know, event. But is it a training event? Not exactly. So, um, then what do you suggest then in terms of training of um, the layman? Because I guess, you know, you have very rightfully highlighted that there is, you know, the difference between awareness, training. And I guess from my perspective is I'm also worried about those um, youths who may be experiencing genuine mental health conditions who do need help. So how do we get this training out to the ground? So, of course, we, we, we thought about this, right? The two places, that, the schools, but that starts with the young. You know, that's uh, when they go to school. Uh, MOE is doing this at the first level, but we probably need to up it up uh, a little uh, for the peer supporters, what specific skills and competencies. Uh, and then the workplaces, that's where people are. And you have organizational support and, and the ability to create those ecosystems. Um, I actually, uh, yesterday I came off a talk on, on, on HR, and I think that, um, you know, uh, we need to work with the organizations, the workplaces, could start with small uh, enterprises, uh, create that training opportunity within workplaces. Make it, I mean, you know, in a, uh, I, I work in a, you know, I'm the CEO of a hospital, right? So I say, okay, everybody, you need to be BCLS trained to work. And guess what? Everyone is BCLS trained. So is, that's, a, that's something that companies can do, right? And um, of course, create flexibility around this, but have that feedback forum, which is important in mental health because it's very personal. And then um, instead of just talking about fitness in terms of physical uh, fitness, uh, what about fitness for mental health? What does that mean? What is, is it just physical fitness? Maybe a little bit of Zumba, not too much spin, but, <laughs> but what else do you need? Those kind of things are important, and we need to think, uh, talk about it with, uh, you know, um, I think there is a bit of that tough app and, and, and all the tripartite, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, ceiling has gone off, but, but the minister knows that that's important. We need to get that out to our community. Can I just add a minute? I understand time is up. So just to follow on on what Daniel said about workplace and what ministers say about workplace, uh, there are three components. One is really besides uh, emotional health literacy. The other is really being able to provide the first aid uh, when you come across one. Uh, so the third thing is really uh, the, the, the caregiver or the peer support self-care. Uh, we come across, we have come across many students who are actually supporting their, their, their classmates, their friends, but they themselves were drained out emotionally and they themselves got burned up and they ended up seeing us in the clinic. So I think self-care is very important uh, so that they actually end up well by doing something good. Yeah. Can I could just add one last part. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's great that we're having uh, peer support in schools now and just linking that to the fact that students are ultimately going to enter the workplaces. So if there was a sort of national coordinated approach to peer support where your students who are trained in school can carry on to become peer supporters at the workplace, um, you know, that might be useful for the country in terms of investment uh, and for workplaces as well, where, as Minister pointed out, there's a lot of fear of the unknown and these peer supporters could come in and help to mitigate some of that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you everyone for your insights and you know I think there's a great opportunity for us to all come together so that we can have a coordinated response to the youth mental health crisis and I'd like to thank the audience for posing all the questions and please continue to join us in session two on the role of uh, the digital world in youth mental health. Thank you everyone. <laughs>